from Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles bushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble in your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in their ways, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like the one who is unclean in our righteous deeds or like filthy cloths. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hands of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, and we are the work of your hands. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord and do not remember our iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. As the people of God, we come today to worship him in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The writer of Isaiah dreams of the day when the heavens will be opened and God will come down. I am guessing like you dream of the day when anger and politics and politicians is gone. I dream of the day where people see each other for who they are, not for the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, their nationality, or their religion. I dream of a day when I never again have to hear the word COVID or cancer, when sickness or mental or physical illness is no more when we trust that death is not the ending, but just a new beginning. I dream of the day when there are empty beds in immigration detention centers, in prisons, and in hospitals. I dream of the day when no one sleeps out in the cold, or no one goes to bed hungry. I dream of the day when war is no more, and love wins. I dream of the world where all kids get to be kids. I dream, and we continue, all continue to dream of better days, not thinking that such dreams are folly. I dream as I hope you dream, because the moment we stop dreaming of better days, then we might forget that this world as it is today is not what God ever dreamed for us. So today we light the first Advent candle, the candle of hope. Hope is the very thing that keeps us dreaming. May this light be an invitation to keep awake. May this light be our invitation to be Advent people, people who dream of light in the darkness. Let us pray. Original dreamer, over and over again in scripture, we hear your dream for a beautiful world. We hear your dream for peace and reconciliation. We hear your dream for harmony and togetherness. We hear your dream for community and hope. We hear your dreams and yet we do not open our eyes. We continue to live with the curtains drawn, the covers pulled tight, eyes shut to the reality of our world. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us and rekindle in us a hope that will burn through the darkness of nights. Give us the strength and the will to keep awake in this sleeping world. With hope and with prayer, we pray this and so much more in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile until the sun. less selfishness, less greed, 
My hope is that more people would understand and know God. My hope is that what I would like to happen, my hope is simply what I would like to happen. But it is often the case that the things for which we hope, for the most part, are often out of our control. And therefore, the things that we have hope in, we often have to wait for patiently. Romans 8 captures these groanings that are often a part of hope. Paul writes that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, groaning inwardly while we wait. Now hope that is seen, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we do hope for what we do not see, then we wait for it with patience. Advent is a reminder to us. It's a time set aside to remember that the ultimate hope is in God. And while all we can do is wait and hope for the day when Christ will return and every knee will bow, our gospel reminds us today that while we wait, we are not to do so passively. But instead, we are to keep awake. We are to be alert. We are to beware of things that might be a threat to that hope. For while we wait, things are still happening. God is still at work. And the question becomes, do we see it? Do we see where God is at work in the world? Do we see where God is at work clear enough that what we see translates into hope? Do we let what we see transform us? In the Gospel of Mark, more than any other Gospel, there is a theme running through it of being prepared. Over and over again, the disciples are portrayed as blind or ignorant to what Jesus is doing and are therefore unprepared. Over and over, the disciples fail to recognize the work of God, despite knowing that he is the Messiah. In Mark 14, Jesus asked, Could you not stay awake one hour? In the critical time, before Jesus was falsely accused and betrayed and hung on the cross, the disciples were asleep. Have you ever wondered what might have been different if they had been awake, if they had been prepared, if they had been on alert? For us today, I don't think our temptation is necessarily being ignorant to what God is doing. Instead, for us in our busy world, especially around Christmas, I think our biggest obstacle is distraction. Maybe for us it's better to say Jesus wants us to stay focused. We hear Jesus calling us to stay alert, but do we know why? What does it mean to stay alert? Have you ever asked yourself, what is at stake if we allow ourselves to get distracted? If we allow our sense of God to get dull? If we allow our faith to sleep? What happens when we allow our faith to fall by the wayside? This week in Bible study, we read and studied the story of the first Pentecost, found in Acts 2. And it reminded me what it looks like when people are full of the Holy Spirit, when we are awake and not asleep. And let me assure you, your spirit can't sleep when the Holy Spirit is around. But what happens when we don't feel the Spirit, when we forget to stay awake? If we don't do what we're supposed to do as the people of God, what happens? What happens if we get distracted and get busy? It is way too easy for us to fill our lives with people and things that make Jesus and his desire for us in our lives less than real. It is easy to get distracted to the point that we stop hearing the voices of those crying out from the wilderness. Well, this year I'm hoping to amplify these voices just a bit during Advent. A few weeks ago, Charlotte reached out to me and told me a, an event that is happening today around the world. It's an event called Keep Awake, and it was organized by the Friends of Seville, North America. The purpose of this event is to lift up the cries of injustice that are coming out of Palestine and have been for years now. 
I told her I would join lifting up Palestine in our prayers today. But as part of this idea to stay awake, I also want to share with you my own experience that I had while in Palestine and what I learned while I was there. In fact, I'm hoping to share stories throughout Advent, stories that bring home the theme of the candle we light each week, themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. Stories I hope will awaken us to think in a new way of what those words mean. Stories that hopefully awaken our spirit and move us to hear the cries of those in need. It's been almost eight years since I traveled with a group of seminary students to the Holy Land on a 17-day adventure. Looking back, all I can say is that before I went to Israel, I was asleep in all the ways that Jesus warns. I was asleep to the most important issues in politics that I would encounter on my trip. Despite the fact that seminary proactively gave us a look, bit, book, list of books to read before we left and strict instructions on the do's and don'ts in regard to our behavior and warned us of the situation, somehow I still managed to naively embark on this trip saying, I'm open-minded, I can see both sides of the conflict, both Israel's side and Palestine's side. We didn't hear, we don't hear much in this country of the struggle that Palestine faces. We hear of bombings in Gaza or Israeli soldiers killed. But what we don't hear is the oppression and the injustice that is happening in the, to the Palestine people over in the Holy Land. Eight years ago, as I got off the plane, I was greeted by our Palestinian tour guide, and I didn't think much about it. But what he would teach me throughout the next few weeks not through words, but through what he endured in his actions, it would open my eyes to what I am guessing is some of the greatest injustice going on in our world today. When our trip started, we traveled by bus around northern Israel, going from site to site around the Sea of Galilee, then later going even further north to the areas of Dan near the Syrian border. Throughout this trip, we could see mingled in the ancient ruins remnants of the layers of empires that have occupied Israel over the years, including relatively modern-day trenches from wars fought, recently fought with Syria. Near the Jordan River, we saw fences, fenced-off areas where landmines, active landmines were. And as this tour of the countryside went on, it became more and more aware of the country of the country on tour where areas where this, our guide was uncomfortable, submissive almost. I also became more and more aware by simply looking out the window of the stark differences between Israel and Palestine. I would compare the differences of what you would see here among Main Street maybe 10 years ago compared to Bexley and what Bexley looks like. Like Bexley, Israel was all shiny and well kept. Palestine was older, maybe even dirtier, but dirtier in a way that says that hope on a daily basis is a struggle, that life is a struggle and there are not the resources for shiny and new. And it all started to sink in around day six when we went to Hebron to visit the cave of the patriarchs, the traditional burying place of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the reality of the division and conflict between seeing people sharing this tiny little land that they all love so dearly could no longer be denied. Huge sections of the city of Hebron have been fenced off, and there's a neutral zone going down the middle where nobody can be. It's like a ghost town. And this neutral zone is dividing Palestine with a new settlement that Israel has built on Palestinian land. As we walked through the Palestinian market, they had to have fences overhead to catch the garbage that was thrown down from the brand new settlement houses that overlooked the market. Just to be nasty, people living in these houses threw cabbage, eggs, you name it. They threw it out the window in the hopes of targeting the Palestinians in the market below. 
Although I could not understand the words, I could understand the tone of voice from which we heard shouts of hatred from the Israeli voices above. The next day, as we neared Jerusalem, our tour bus stopped, and our tour guide jumped out and had to get in a car. It was later explained that he was not allowed to enter Jerusalem with us. He would have to go through another route that might take hours, maybe even days, to enter, despite the fact that Jerusalem was his home, the place of his birth. But he was the lucky one. Most Palestinians no longer are allowed anywhere near Jerusalem. And then near Bethel, right outside of Jerusalem, American tourists are allowed to walk a simple five-mile, five-minute walk down a path from site to site. But yet again, our tour guide had to get in, a car, get in a car and drive over an hour to get to where we were on the other side. But one day, more than any other day, forever changed my view of the conflict in Palestine. That day was the day we went to, to visit an American Jew who was living in an, in an Israeli settlement house on Palestinian land. Illegal settlements are popping up all over the West Bank. What happens is the Jews confiscate the land, and the Palestinians who own the land have no way to stop the development. We saw pictures of total Palestinian villages destroyed while shiny new Israeli suburbs are built. One member of our group asked the Jewish gentleman how he felt living on this land, and his answer was, it's not Palestinian land, it is his land given to his ancestors by God. All of Israel was Jewish land, he said, and his hope was that the building wouldn't stop until Israel was again one nation and Palestine was no more. The frankness and the arrogance to which he said this was startling. He had no remorse and no care for the land and the people who were left homeless. Later after that afternoon, we then went to visit the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And what stood out to me was the way that so many of the same things that were done to the Jews during Hitler's reign, the Jews were now doing to the Palestinians. Although there was no concentration camps, ethnic cleansing is alive and well today in the Holy Land. And the Jews justify all that they have done, all they continue to do, and all they plan to do in the name of God. I'm not just telling, I'm just telling you a small part of this story, of what I witnessed and what I saw. The stories we heard were numerous. At a Lutheran hospital in East Jerusalem that treats Palestinians, children are forced to go and do treatment alone because their parents are not allowed to enter Palestine, or enter Jerusalem if they're Palestinian. Our tour guide's family has not been able to enter Jerusalem for over five years, even though they have a home there. They now have to reside in Ramallah. Israel controls all the fresh water that runs from the Jordan River, and they sell this water at high prices to the Palestinians. Palestinian college students are harassed and often kept from attending classes by Israeli soldiers who set up checkpoints near the campus. Walls, fences, soldiers with guns, violence, injustice, inhuman treatment. All the Israeli government inflicts upon the Palestinians goes unchecked by the world, except for a few declarations by the UN and other governing bodies that Israel just ignores. Sabeel is an organization of Christian Palestinians. We often forget that there are Christians, brothers and sisters of Christ, living there, suffering the same injustice. And what Sabeel is asking us is that we join them in praying for Palestine. I have more information if you'd like to get on their list where each week they send out prayers that you can pray. And we can talk after worship. But please don't hear me saying that all Jews living in Israel are bad. I'm not saying that. But the government is making policies that are unjust. And I'm simply wanting to lift the struggle of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ up in prayer. 
and I hope you will join me doing so each week. Advent this year is going to be different, and my hope is that we let the differences wake us up a bit, that we let these next four weeks leading up to Christmas be a time where we identify one issue that we are passionate about, one issue that we're willing to get involved in, one issue of injustice that we feel God is calling us to be involved in, one issue that will take us out of our comfort zone, one issue that keeps us awake to the ways that God is moving in our world and the hopes that seeing God at work will give us a new way of thinking. I hope that we can find more hope and pass that hope along to those crying out as their hope wanes. Christ is coming, but while we wait, we are to be his people and share his light in the darkness. Share the hope that one day justice will reign that forgiveness is real, that grace is always available and ready to those who believe. May you be awakened this Advent season to see how very much God is needed in our world and sincerely pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.